From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dr. Lionel Champion here, Mr. Dollar. Who? I'm surprised Meg McCarty didn't answer. I ordered her to keep you in bed there at her place until I could see you again. I am in bed. And I take it you're the doctor who bandaged me up this way, put on this splint. That's right. After I tangled with a propeller at Captain Morgan's fishing boat this morning. Yes, only it was yesterday. Huh? You were unconscious when the captain and his men brought you in. After treating you, I gave you sedation. Oh. Rest was the most important thing. How did you ever happen to fall off that boat? Fall? Doctor, I was pushed. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Cod Harbor, Massachusetts. To the Intercoastal Maritime and Life Insurance Company, Boston. Assignment, the Meg's Palace Matter. Report and expense account continued. As soon as I hung up on Dr. Champion, I again checked the splint on my right leg and confirmed the suspicion that I couldn't possibly walk on it. Then, a few minutes later, Meg McCarthy came into my room. She carried a tray filled with enough food to choke a horse. And while I piled into it, she brought me up to date. It's in Barnesboro that Dr. Champion has his office. And lucky it was for you, he happened to be here in Cod Harbor on his weekly visit. Oh, you were a sorry-looking mess when the men brought you in. Yesterday, the doctor said. You've been out as cold as a codfish ever since. But I can tell by the looks that the rest has done a lot for you. How do you feel? As a matter of fact, Meg, I feel pretty... Oh, well, pretty good. There, you see, you've got to take it easy, like the doctor said. Just lay there and rest and sleep and eat all the good food I bring you. Yeah, except and unless I get up and going on this case. You'll try that and I'll lash you to the bedpost. Doctor's orders is doctor's orders, so don't you try nothing different. Yes, ma'am. Oh, it's a miracle, praise be, that that propeller on the Lillian didn't cut you to ribbons. Captain Billy and his crew brought me back here, huh? Who else? Where are they now? Fishing out on the banks, of course. What did you expect? Don't you know they have to earn a living the same as me and you? And what about keeping up the payments on that seagoing bathtub? Precious little time they had for fishing yesterday after that fool trick you pulled falling off of her. Is that what they told you happened? Of course. What else? Meg, which of the men told you I'd fallen off the boat? <laughs> All of them. Only the first mate, young Charlie Montgomery, the engineer, and, of course, my Willie by himself, Captain Morgan, to you. And they all told it the same way? What? Why not? Should they be after making up fairy tales? How did they tell it? You're sure that screw didn't hit you on the head, too? You lost your memory? How did they tell it, Meg? It's important. Well, whilst they went about their chores, you were standing alone up in the bows. Then they heard you yell. Yeah? Despite of the darkness, they seen you splash in the phosphorescent wake. And there you were, being sucked under by the prop. That's all. And they all told it the same? Exactly the same. Even young Charlie Buttons kept saying it over and over. I saw it, I saw it all. Oh. Like, well, you know, like he was still struck with the fear of what might have happened to you. I wonder. Well, stop wondering and get yourself some more sleep, or the doctor will have me head. And if he does, I'll take it out on you. And believe me, Johnny boy, that will be a lot worse than the fool accident of yours ever was. Meg, listen to me. It was no accident. What? I was thrown overboard. Oh, Johnny boy, you're raving delirious out of your head. I was leaning over the rail, watching the water, and a powerful pair of arms belonging to somebody aboard that boat picked me up and tossed me over. Saints, who? Ole Jensen, young Charlie Buttons, Montgomery, or Captain Billy himself. You start raving, Johnny. You must have got hit on the head. And I'll bet my last buck that whoever did it is the same one who slugged me in the alley, the same one who threatened to burn you out of this place of yours. Oh, no. And the minute I get up out of this bed, I... Tell me something. Yes? Tim Beasley, your police chief and mayor and so on. Yes? Has he been up here to see you? That good for nothing, brother, Scott, no. And what's more, if he shows his ugly face in my establishment, I'll toss him out on his beam ends. But why do you ask? Because I told him to get the threatening notes from you. Check them against the handwriting of several people here in Cod Harbor. Who? Like that sniveling cousin of his, Clem Harris, that runs the Silver Plate Cafe? Yeah, among others. Well, he ain't been here. And I won't have him here. 
I take it you and he don't get along. Of course we don't. Why? Because ever since his cousin Clem has been in business, Tim has threatened to close me up. For what reason? For breaking town ordinances on restaurants. The kind he enforces over to Barnesboro. Well, have you been breaking them? No more than no less than dear cousin Clem or Tony Fortin or Ernie Turner does after their harsh joints. But me, he always is picking on, and why? Because I get most of the business from the fishermen. So you want a suspect in this case, Johnny boy? You've named them for me, Meg. The other cafe owners. All right, so I'll give you one. Tim Beasley and Clem Harris working in cahoots. And if it wasn't one of them waylaid you in the alley... Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Neither of them could have been aboard the Lily Ann. Then you must have fell. Oh, Meg, when is the doctor coming to see me? Mm, he should be here by now. Well, if he doesn't come pretty soon, I'm getting up and going, orders or no orders. Johnny? Motives, suspects... Why, Meg McCarthy herself could have rigged this whole thing. Called me in as a cover-up while she burned up her place to collect 15,000 insurance. Even her intended, Captain Billy Morgan, who'd collect her life insurance if she were to die in a fire. Tim Beasley, lazy slob of a general factotum in Cod Harbor, to put Meg's palace out of business in behalf of his cousin, Clem Harris. Or Clem himself. Or one of Captain Billy's crew, for some reason I hadn't yet fathomed. Half an hour later, Dr. Champion arrived, looked me over, and then went to work with a pair of bandage shears. So, now we'll take off that splint. Oh, but if something's broken, Doc. <laughs> Not a thing broken, Mr. Dollar. Just an old trick of mine. Huh? You needed absolute rest until I could see you again. And from what I've heard about you, you wouldn't have taken it unless I fooled you into it. And that was the sole reason for the splint. <laughs> Doc, you're a wonder. <laughs> there we are. And in view of your surprisingly good condition, I'd say you may be up and around as soon as you honestly feel able. Say, even tomorrow, perhaps. Item eight, ten dollars for medical services. All the Dr. Champion would accept. Needless to say, as soon as he left, I planned to get up and get to work. But as he walked out the door, Meg brought Captain Billy in to visit and sympathize. So, in hope of keeping him off guard, I played real sick. Then only in Montgomery came in, too. But I needed to get these men alone, and I must admit, be feeling better than I did. And then I realized that young Charlie hadn't come. I asked about him. Well, Burnsboro, Johnny, said as long as the doctor was keeping you in bed two or three days, he could see you when he gets back. But wait a minute. Uh, he went to pick up some supplies for Meg here like he always does. Uh, it gives him a chance to drop in on his sister where he keeps his Sunday clothes and things. He wasn't out on the boat with you today? Nah, Meg spoils a lot. That boy always has him going in for supplies when I need him the uh, most. Look here now, Willie boy. You talk like I was the one picked today. Well, of for course him. you did. Of you course do. I didn't, and don't you tell me. He said it was you. Yeah, you're off your, your course, Mr. Oh, Martha. I am. You know blast as well as you are. don't you shake your finger at me, you blue yeah, nose. Pipe down, dabble. woman. Do you want Mr. Down. Dollar to have a real laugh? You. Oh, Johnny boy. I'm sorry. Shut up, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, Maggie. And but tell me boy, that... I'm sorry if I seem to be raising my voice at you. Oh, bless you, Meg. It's that fiery spirit that keeps me loving you. Yeah, but now, uh, why don't we leave the poor man alone to recover, huh? Come on, boys. Yes, come on, all of you. Out you go. After you, Meg. Oh, After my, you. how polite we are. Montgomery, wait. Oh, Mr. Donner, something I can do for you to ease your bed of pain. A little drink of something. Of a bottle aboard the Lily Ann. No, no, thanks. I want to talk to you about Charlie. A real fine lad he is. Now, I'm sure he'll be wanting to see you when he gets back from his visit in town. No, no, wait. Uh, Captain Morgan said he has a sister in Barnesboro. Do you know the address? Oh, that I do. <laughs> Many's a fine meal we've had from her on our time off. Well, I want to see her. You know, just a little personal thing. Oh, then, here, I'll write down the address for you. She lives in a pretty little house on the corner of Rose. <laughs> Maybe Montgomery was the wrong one to ask, I don't know. But I had to gamble somewhere along the line. And if my suspicions about Charlie Buttons was right, I hoped I wouldn't be too late. When Montgomery had left, I sneaked out the back door to avoid Meg and hurried over to Tim Beasley's office in the shack that functioned as Cod Harbor City Hall. He wasn't there. A woman who lived next door informed me he'd taken off in a hurry to Barnesboro. So Beasley had gone to town after Charlie. Or had he? For $25, that's item nine, I rented a creaky old truck and headed for Barnesville. Charlie's sister's house was on a gravel road out on the edge of town. There was 
was no other car there, so I stopped in front of the place. Got out and walked up to the front door. Sorry, mister, but my sister... Mr. Dollar. Hello, Charlie. Yeah, I... I meant to say, why didn't you come in? Sure glad to see you're all right, Mr. Dollar. Are you? That sure was awful. You, you're falling off the boat that way. What's the matter, Charlie? Aren't you feeling good? Yeah, sure. Sure I am. You look a little pale. And say... Well, well. Packing up to leave, huh? Yeah, I... Well, I'm tired of the fishing business, Mr. Dollar. Going to give it up. Go somewhere else during a living. Tired of it, yeah. Why did you do it, Charlie? Huh? I, I don't know what you mean. It took somebody who knew that boat pretty well to sneak up on me in the dark and push me overboard. It took a strong, young pair of arms to do it, too. Yours, weren't they? Well? I didn't want to do it, Mr. Dollar. So help me, I didn't want it. But he made me. Yeah? Who made you? He found out. He, he found out about me, about my record. What record? That, that I'd killed a man once, accidentally, when I was just a kid. That I'd run out and escape from the reformatory. It, but now I'm grown. If they ever catch me, they'll hang me or the electric chair up for life. And he knew that. Charlie. If I didn't do anything he said, like slugging you or trying to start the fires or anything, he'd give me away. So I had to, don't you see? I couldn't help myself. He made me do everything. Charlie, who, Charlie, who? It's all right. You don't need to rough me up, Dollar. I knew I'd get caught up with someday. I'll go quiet with you. And maybe, maybe you'll help to, to try and get things easy for me. Charlie, who made you try to kill me? Yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you. It was so he could get you out of the way and burn up Meg's palace and her with it. I'll tell you, Mr. Dollar, it was... Oh, no. Huh? There, at the window, behind you. That old trick. Oh, no, you... Help! The boy fell against me, pinning me to the floor. And as I pushed him away, I saw the patch of red slowly spreading on the front of his shirt directly above the heart. By the time I got to the window, a car had taken off down the old gravel road and was completely obscured by a thick cloud of dust. And I wondered. I wondered for whom the shot that killed Charlie had really been intended. Here's our star to tell you about the final episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a killer strikes again. But one of his victims rises from the grave to strike back. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone who also wrote this week's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Uh-huh.